Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi right, guys, let's get started. It's another Vaccination Database Seminar series. We're super excited today to have Gia Shi. Uh, she's the Vice President on the Exadata team at Oracle. Uh, so Gia's background is, I mean, it's, it's interesting, but it's only two things, right? She's been at Stanford, she's been at Oracle. So she has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree at Oracle, or at, from Stanford. Uh, and then she's been at Oracle for 18 years, since 2002. So that's awesome. Um, so as, as always, if you have any questions for Gia as she gives the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, where you're coming from, uh, and ask your question. And feel free to do this anytime to interrupt. We want this to be interactive. That way Gia's not talking to the empty space that is Zoom uh, for an hour. So with that, Gia, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm super excited to be here today, um, you know, to be part of this database vaccination seminar. And what I bring to you is I hope, you know, a journey. Well, I take you on a ride. Let's go under the hood of an Exadata transaction. And uh, the sort of the highlights of the day is how do we harness the power of persistent memory? Um, with that said, let's go ahead and get started on the journey. All right. So some of you may have uh, heard of Exadata. Some of you may not have heard of an Exadata. So I thought I would like kind of start off start by setting the stage and introducing to you what is an Exadata. So let's meet one. And uh, um, Andy said that I've been working at Oracle for 18 years. So I actually have been working on Exadata for 10 years. <laughs> so it's actually a product that has, you know, had, you know, over a turn, um, a decade old, but this is the latest and greatest um, product in that family. We call it XADM. And as you can see on the uh, screen, what's here is that we have a um, XADM2, uh, which is the database. I have a database icon here. So this is a database server and it runs the latest uh, Intel Xeon processor and has you know two models. One is a two socket model um, and the other is an A socket, which is more like a small SMP box that's packed in there with a lot of sockets, a lot of cores. Um, the two socket is the most popular one because you can have a bunch of them and be able to, you know, create a cluster. And then on the bottom of the slide shows and storage server. So a storage server is actually where the data resides. And we have two types, two types of storage server. The first kind is we call it high capacity. And the name indicates that it has a lot of storage. So we have 168 terabytes of hard disk in that storage server. Um, and we couple, like we pair it with 25 terabytes of flash which we use to build a flash cache on top of that hard disk for you know, IO acceleration. The other option is you can have an extreme flash, which is you know, all flash storage, and then it's a little bit uh, shy on the capacity side because of the high cost of flash. So this is very straightforward, right? Standard two-tier computing, you have your database, you have your storage, and uh, how do I connect these two? So we have um, this 100 gigabit Ethernet um, that's connecting the database and storage. And a quick word about the, the need for networking here is that our database kind of scales because we have a shared disk architecture for Oracle Rack Cluster. So as you needed more you know, database processing power, you just add more database servers to it. So that's pretty simple. On the storage side, it's the same scaling story because we actually take all of our database data and then we kind of chop them into you know, smaller allocation units, like we call them extents. And then we place all the extents, we kind of call it stripe and mirror everywhere. So we put all the extents across all the disks in our system. And then we also create mirror redundancy for HA. And that allows us to basically linearly scale of our uh, storage servers as the capacity grows. And on top of that because we have a, a layer of uh, storage site caching. So our flash cache also scales linearly both in capacity and also in performance. So having a very fast network that kind of connect the two tiers, extremely important. And we're running on the 100 gigabits um, ethernet. And there's a little catch to it called RDMA. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but this is kind of a quick intro of the concept. 
And then last but not least, I want to uh, introduce this, you know, prime, I guess, like the, 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 the famous actor of this show, which is, you know, persistent memory, right? Like we talked about that. And I wanted to mention that we do have 1.5 terabytes of persistent memory in our storage server, each one of our storage server. And I'm going to kind of, you know, spend, spend and take you on a journey just to see how we actually um, make use of it. All right, with that said, I just wanted so to emphasize that. Go ahead. I, I think it'd be, it'd be useful for the students to have a ballpark of what this costs. Like okay, range. okay. All right. So um, I am actually not a product manager. <laughs> okay. So I have been told me, I may not give the right price. So I've been told that list price for a full rack, which is what you see here on the slides, or you can see it, you know, on my <laughs> background as well. That's a standard uh, 42U server, uh, uh, like a rack. You can pack a database server, 14 storage server in there, and with a you know, and two redundant network switches. So that costs you a million dollars. I think it's a nice round number. Ashish, is that right? <laughs> yeah, and so then, what, you're talking, what you're talking about, Java, is the on premises version. And okay. so it can scale from a really small unit to what Java is referring yeah. to. But now gonna, in the cloud version, you can consume it by the literally by the minutes, by the hour. Right, it right. Down the cost substantially in a consumption model. Right. All right. This is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ashish. So, and um, Andy and everyone, as you see, there's this sort of nice graphics that talks about like what Ashish said. On prem, you can grow from eighth to quarter and elastically adding all the database server and storage servers as you see fit. And it actually grows all the way to multiple racks and uh, similarly for the A socket. And in the cloud, like as Ashish talked about, we kind of just charge you by the OCPU and storage. So, it's a lot more elastic that way. So, you can start out really small. All right, so having seen what an exadata looks like, I just wanted to quickly talk about, you know, what is like the value sort of ads that we provide to customers. We really think that it is the best platform to run Oracle database. So we have the best database hardware and the special sauce that we have built. I'm a software developer, so I'm, it's really like software is really dear and near to my heart. We, grow, we build a lot of really smart, interesting software to really harness the power of hardware. We want everything to be hardware bound. So I'm going to talk a lot about that for all TP application today. And we also have a management component that's fully automated. And just to kind of give you folks a sort of a perspective, who are the customers who actually use Exadata, we say 86% of Fortune Global 100 actually run Exadata. So it's not like some, some toy platform or, you know, very bleeding edge kind of technology. It's actually very mature, very stable, very important for our customers. And you may ask, who are the 14% of the Fortune Global 100 that don't run the Exadata? So most of them are our direct competitors, like, you know, Microsoft, IBM, HP, and, you know, it kinda, it's, it's, it's kind of um, very... Uh, reasonable why, why they didn't choose Exadata. But, and also another word about Exadata is that it actually is a converged database. By that, what we mean is it runs both the data warehousing as well as OLTP. But for the majority of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on OLTP, but I just wanna make sure that you guys have this right notion that I can do both. All right. So now I'm really excited to kind of get really, really get started with the show, which is let's go under the hood of an OLTP transaction. Um, as everybody in this seminar knows what an OLTP, right? Online transaction processing. So a very naive question, maybe a person who hasn't taken, you know, Andy's introduction to database internals class or, you know, taking a, a, a database course may ask, what does an OLTP application do, right? So I give a very simple example here. So for lack of a better word, I just, I just call it a super critical OLTP application. So there's an application that sits there. And perhaps in this case, a classic text, textbook example is a banking example, right? So let's say Ben wants to deposit $1,000 to his bank account. Another user, Alice, wants to withdraw 500. Bob wants to transfer. So what ends up happening is that this user, um, let's say Ben, wants to perform this transaction. And what really it translates into is really just go ahead and get my bank account. I'm going to deposit $1,000 in there. So what happens is that the OLTP application we'll go ahead and send an update SQL to the database, right? To say, look, database, please commit this transaction, process this transaction for me. And when the database gets a SQL statement, what the first step it does is it parses it. It tries to figure out how do I even run the SQL? 
So there are usually two cases. One is that, look, somebody else has run similar SQL statement before. I've already built a parser which has a full execution plan in there. So I don't need to, I don't need to repeat the work. And then my parser happened to be you know, in my library cache. So I can go ahead and just use that parser and then go ahead and execute the SQL. So again, that when that happens, it happens you know, at CPU main memory speed, right? Super fast. Or you may want to compile the statement and figure out what, you know, how to execute it. And that requires, you know, metadata on the schema tables and whatnot, which is usually very fast too, because those are very frequently accessed blocks and they will be readily available in the buffer cache of your database instance. So you compile a parser, you say, okay, off we go. So cursor in memory, let's move on to the next step. What happens? How do you deposit $1,000 to Ben's account? You typically maybe use Ben's user ID or maybe his account ID, whatever you may have to traverse a B tree, right? To find his record. Like where is his balance sitting in which uh, data block? And that B tree index traversal is usually very fast because those are frequently accessed blocks. They're hot, they're readily available in the main memory of the buffer cache of the database. So no big deal. I go ahead and you know walk down the index tree and I found that uh, data. So now I finally got to my destination, right? I identify the role where Ben's account resides. So I need to go get that block and then change um, and update the balance. So where's that block? So now this is an interesting question because not everybody <laughs> is accessing their data all the time, right? If somebody else who happened to have access that block just shortly before, you may be able to find it in the buffer cache. But oftentimes you may find that, look, I may have a miss in my buffer cache, which means that it's not in memory. So it's interesting when you come to a cluster database because you may have multiple database instances in the cluster. So it may not be, it may not be in your local main memory, but it could be in somebody else's buffer cache. So we have this mechanism called a ca uh, um, uh, cache fusion. What it does is it goes and probes my neighbor's cache and says, do you have it? If you have it, I'll get it from you instead of having to go to storage because that's much faster. But in this case, let's say, you know, that block isn't even in any of the neighbor's cache. So I have no option except for I have to go to the storage. So what I <laughs> call this operation here is I really wanted to create this, this effect of, look, I have just fallen off an IO cliff. What I mean by that is for the previous three steps, as you can see, all the data I need to perform all those, you know, parsing and traversing a B tree and finding the block they're all in main memory, right? So I'm running at memory, perhaps CPU cache uh, speed. So it's a super fast execution. But as soon as I have a miss, I got to go to storage. And as we can learn from the prior slide, my storage is sitting on the other end of the network, right? Somewhere else over on the storage server. So at that point, I my execution actually runs into a grinding halt because I have to wait for the IO to come back. And that's what we call the IO cliff. So a quick moment about like, I just wanted to kind of talk about what is the random data read IO cliff here? Is that as we talked about earlier, as soon as I identify which role has Ben's account, I need to fetch that block for me to you know, perform the update, right? So naturally we say, okay, you gotta go to storage, let's go Ja. So let's go ahead and figure out how do I get that block from the storage server? So naturally I'll say, look, you know, storage server, this is a block I need, please go ahead and you know, give it back to me. So you may remember that we have like sort of a tiered um, data storage on the on the storage server side where you know we have terabyte ter like 168 terabytes of hard disks and then we have a ca uh, flash cache in there. So let's say in this case, you know, I got really lucky. Ben's data is actually in the flash cache, you know, not just on disk because it's on disk and, you know, the latency is really high, but let's say it was previously accessed, it's in my cell side flash cache. So Okay, that sounds good. I go ahead and probe my flash cache. I found the data. I say, look, I, I got the 8K. I send the block back to the user. Okay, and once the database server gets the block in its own uh, buffer cache, he can continue to process the SQL, right? So we're back um, on the happy track again. So now I have a first question for the audience because Andy said this is extremely you know, interactive session. So I'm going to pose a question for you. How long do you think that the super critical OLTP application had to wait for this AK block read? Any guesses? Please feel free to unmute and talk. It's going to take the flash cache? 
and it's, it's going over RDMA? Um, no RDMA here, right? Because this is okay. like a messaging model, right? Like database sends a message over to the server. It's inside the flash cache. I have to issue a local read from my flash device, and then I send the block back. Um, Two hundred milliseconds. Okay. Two hundred milliseconds. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Nope. All right. Two hundred. <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, that's too high, right?" So I agree. And uh, um, we can break it down. We can break it. Let me take you on tour. So as you know, there are so many different kinds of storage out there, right? And then the mileage really varies. So I don't want to pick on a competitor. They may have 100 or 200 milliseconds. I'm just going to pick on an exadata that's before persistent memory. So let's say just I have an exadata. I have a hard disk. I have flash cache in my storage server. Let's see how long it takes. So the message actually from the database to the storage, you can imagine that, look, you know, I got to go and I send a message. So there's a user to kernel contact switch. The message leaves, um, goes on the wire, arrives at the storage server, um, and like, you know, a hardware interrupt, um, a or like a hardware completion comes in, an interrupt wakes up, you know, a storage server thread, that thread goes and it says, okay, let me do the local read. So, from a flash point of view, depending on what kind of flash protocol you're talking, everybody now, everybody uh, uses MEME flash. So we are pretty confident that a 8K read on a relatively newer flash generation will give you less 100 microsecond latency. So that's the, the local latency, you know, local to the server. After that, you have to go and send a message back to the database and then ship that block over, right? So to complete the uh, entire, cycle, I am going to review the answer. So it's about 200 microseconds end to end on an exadata. And mind you, this is already, you know, a thousand times faster than the 100 milliseconds or 200 millisecond number we heard, right? So this is already a super fast, uh, low latency uh, MIO. And just by simple math, you can tell that the whole sort of uh, overhead, shall, shall we call that, like from the user to kernel, the context switches, all the interrupt processing, is taking about 100 microseconds end to end. So the end to end latency we're seeing is about 200. And then it's kind of a half, half 50 and 50 split between the raw flash latency and everything else that's involved to you know, complete the network IO. So it's not too slow, right? But compare with remember like the CPU cache or main memory access, which is you know, maybe tens and hundreds of nanoseconds. This is you know, much, much order of magnitude longer. So this is, comes our first challenge. How do we conquer this random read IO cliff? Um, so here, another question. I, I put up this jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> They're just two guys in there. Um, do you, I call those uh, a dynamic duel. Anybody recognizes these icons? Like I kind of briefly showed them on the very first slide when we meet on Exadata. Can you kind of squint your eyes and, and, and yell out, what do you think is the guy on the left? What does that look your like? Persistent memory on the left and on the right is your network card probably. Oh, wow, 100 points, very good. So the, the, the left one is the persistent memory and that looks like a DIM, right? So that's how we pop into a DIM, um, a, a, a DIM slot on a CPU socket. So a quick word about persistent memory. Persistent memory is a brand, well, brand new as in, it was released in 2019 by Intel. So it's a relatively new silicon technology. It has very distinct capacity, performance, and price um, behaviors when you compare it to DRAM and flash. So the persistent memory that we use is the Intel Optane Data Center Persistent Memory Module. It's quite a mouthful, but that's what we use. And uh, that actually sits on the CPU socket. So when you populate the persistent uh, um, memory DIMMs, you know, you take a CPU, you take um, your CPU, you actually insert that persistent memory DIM in the socket. So it looks like a DRAM DIM, but it's at the DIM form factor. So at far, as far as reads are concerned, it's really fast, about three to, you know, maybe three to X slower than DRAM, but it's like a heck of a lot faster than flash, you know, much faster than hundred microseconds that we just looked at. And the interesting thing about the persistent memory is that the writes or the stores to those memories actually can survive power failure, unlike DRAM. So that make it extremely attractive for a database application because having persistence and durability, you know, as we know, is, is critical in a lot of database operations. 
However, the problem with um, persistent memory is that you may think, okay, I'm just going to pop in this DIM and all the stores to it is persistent, I'm done. But actually, underneath the cover, <laughs> it requires a lot of sophisticated algorithm to make sure that the data on the PMEM can persist across a power fail. And uh, I'm gonna, you know, touch on those exact points later on in this presentation. Just but a quick um, sort of heads up is that the CPU cache on the on the server is actually not persistent. So if you think that you just did a store and then you did an update and that's persistent, you're delusional because that update is still sitting in the CPU cache. So imagine you you lose the power right then and there, your your your, your update is gonna be gone. You're not gonna see it when when the server powers back up. So the trick here is that you got to be careful about, you know, flushing the data or bypassing um, the CPU cache when you want to make the data persistent. The second part is that we're so used to disk and flash, right? Like they have sector atomicity, 512 by 4K, whatnot. But persistent memory has a distinct characteristics in terms of write atomicity, and it's actually have a profound impact on how we can use them for database applications. So I'll talk about that later, but these are the two things to sort of keep in mind. All right, so I think the prior gentleman has, you know, already answered the question perfect, so I'm not going to repose it. So the guy on the right is uh, RDMA. So quick word about RDMA. RDMA stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. So this is actually not a new notion. Um, it has been in the networking world for a while, but it started with InfiniBand. So it was kind of a more of a niche technology, lesser known. But nowadays, I think you will hear about RDMA a lot more, you know, in the, uh, it's going a lot more mainstream. So let me quickly kind of break down what an RDMA is. If you look at a server, let's say I'm just looking at the database server on the, on the left. Um, the memory region is basically a piece of memory that's sitting on your main memory. You know, it's like, a, 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 you know, it's on SD or memory, whatever memory you may have. And from a server point of view, there are just really two ways of accessing that memory, right? One is a CPU core can just go do load and stores to that memory. The second way, which you don't kind of think about it, but it's actually there to enable your day-to-day -day networking is that a network NIC can access that memory through a PCIe bus. So what RDMA does is exploits the second use case is that you can actually authorize your uh, RDMA enabled NIC to say that, look, you have access, you can pin this piece of memory to your card. You can imagine that's kind of tethered to your card. So what that ends up enabling you to do is that if you have a remote peer who can actually um, connect to you that remote peer can go ahead and perform a memory access, either be a read or write directly to a local memory without like bypassing all that software handling that usually happens during a messaging protocol. So this is what happens with RDMA. And then the, in order to create a RDMA um, capability, the two NIC have to support RDMA to begin with. So they call RDMA enable NIC. And then RDMA actually requires a lossless um, uh, L2 layer. So to do that on top of um, Ethernet is, is additional challenge. You need the, um, you also need the switch to be able to help you with Rocky as well. So I'll talk about that shortly. But um, just kind of quickly putting things together is that if you have two endpoints, like a, let's say a process running on the database server on the left and a process running on the storage server on the right, you form a connection between them that you call it like a RDMA connection. And then you do the handshake and then they can authorize each other to access their own memory region through their control plane, you know, messaging. So you can pre-authorize access to the memory region. And later on, you can imagine that the server can go and update his own memory region. And then the database server, the client in this case can just go directly access that update without, you know, involving with any of the software stack running on the server. So that is a very, very crucial piece of information to keep in mind because that is actually what enable us to really harness the power out of persistent memory. So with that said, let's move on to what's special about RDMA over converged ethernet. Like I said earlier, RDMA is not something new. It was invented, you know, decades ago. InfiniBand has always had that. And in fact, you know, when Exadata started out more than 10 years ago, we have been using RDMA, but on InfiniBand. And the reason for that, it gives you really low CPU latency, very high throughput, and very low network latency. So 
Um, with all those three um, beautiful, you know, attributes of RDMA, we're we're a big fan. But back then, InfiniBand was the only sort of player in town because to get to the throughput that you want on your network, Ethernet is nowhere close. But over the last 10 years, the gap has basically gone completely closed out. So Ethernet has the same kind of bandwidth as already as InfiniBand as we, we look at the market today. So that's why we switched over to the latest and greatest 100 gigabits Ethernet as well, even for RDMA, because it really allows Exadata. You think about Exadata, you pull it into a data center, be it on-prem or be it on cloud. What do you think what the other machines are running? What kind of networking are they running? Are they going to run InfiniBand? Most likely not, right? They're all going to be running Ethernet. So having RDMA over Ethernet, it's extremely attractive because it allows you to be able to kind of integrate your own RDMA network as part of the bigger data center network. And then um, that's why we kind of have kind of cut over to using uh, Rocky, which is really the shore for RDMA over converged Ethernet. But you can't use a standard Ethernet switch for Rocky, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly that's a- absolutely true. So what happens is that a standard Ethernet switch is sort of I guess lack the rocky <laughs> features, right? So there's uh, if there's congestion happening in your network, the packets getting dropped and whatnot, you need a rocky switch that um, you know does the, um, known as ECM, the uh, early congestion notifications and all that to avoid um, the packet drops to enable a s- successful RDMA stack. So you're absolutely right. Not only NIC has to be RDMA enabled, the switch also has to be RDMA, RDMA enabled as well. All right, so meanwhile, back at the wrench, what happened to Ben's transaction? <laughs> we, we had a nice segue off to the, for the dynamic duel, but let me kind of combine those two threads together. So the theme of, of the story here is we really are looking to persistent memory and RDMA to help us conquer the IO cliff. So let's bring back this picture again. We've seen this picture before. It kind of talks about, you know, I have a flash cache on the storage server side. You know, I can do a local read. So one of the very natural sort of reaction to this is, okay, now Jia, you tell, us, you tell me that, you know, PMEM is very fast. It sits on the memory bus. You get memory latency. It's persistent. You don't lose any data on that across a power fail. So why don't I treat it like I treat, you know, I use a flash. I, I, I just build a PMEM cache on it, right? Which is very, very reasonable. So let's give it a try. Let's see what happens then. So let's say I, I take all my flash cache code. It's all caching code anyways. I drop it onto PMEM. I bring, I build a tiered caching. So, you know, I have PMEM on top of my flash cache. Sure, I have a PMEM cache working. And then when it comes to latency, it's very close to memory. So if I read an 8K from a PMEM, like if it's local on the same CPU core, it's about one microsecond. If you have to go to the second core, you know, remember we have a two cores, uh, sorry, second socket. We have a two socket system. You have to go through a UPI link. It adds a little bit of latency. So it's about, you know, two to three microseconds. So both are very reasonable, right? So you're thinking about, oh, I have like a low single digit microsecond latency. Now I have a hundred microsecond added for all my networking and then, you know, send, sending the messages and copy the block back. So I'm going to ask you what happens to the IO cliff? Well, you will think, okay, I was able to get a, a get rid of that 100 microsecond latency of flash and replace it with this, you know, a couple microsecond latency uh, from PMAN cache. So that's great. I cut my latency in half. So my, my IO clip used to be that high. Now it's half as high, right? It's like 50% reduction in latency. But somehow it just doesn't feel that gratifying, right? Because you'd be like, look, I actually get to read AK from persistent memory within like a couple of microseconds. But Jia, you're telling me from the database point of view, end to end, I am still seeing 100 microsecond latency. You know, it's just kind of, can we do better? And the answer is, yeah, we think we can do better. And especially with the help of RDMA, because this is a very radical approach, in our opinion, is that Look, when you go traditional way of messaging is you really like wake up another guy on the other end, right? To say, look, I need this block. You know where this block is. Go fetch it and send it back to me. And that whole kind of talking, you know, shall we say, is actually expensive when it comes to IO latency. So the way that we want to address this is we want to get rid of all that chit chat. Like don't talk to the other guy. It's just too slow. Self-service is the best way to go. It gives you the latest, lowest latency. It gives you the results with the low, uh, lowest latency. 
So how do we sell service? How do we go and say, look, I want an AK block and get me over there. So we do a RDMA over 100 gigabit on Rocky, as we talked about before. And before we're looking at the internals of that, I just wanted to share a quick results with you, is that we are able to not only go from 2x of the latency, which is you know the 100 microsecond we talked about, and we're actually able to get a 10x latency reduction when we do that. So the end-to-end -end latency from a database point of view is drastically reduced to sub-19 microseconds. And we put this up because that's what we put in our documentation, our data sheet. And this latency number is actually achieved with multiple millions of IOPS happening in the system. So if you are just having a lower IOPS, you know, if you look at some other flash vendors, IOPS, maybe, you know, 10K, 60K, 250K, whatever they may have. And those lower IOPS, I actually have seen much lower latency, like 13, 14, 15, 16. So, so it really, um, it really is quite, quite impressive. So let me kind of go down under the hood to see, hey, how do we get to this 19 microsecond latency? So remember, we had a miss in the buffer cache. So that's why we have to go to the storage server. So the first step that we do is we really want to be able to perform that read through an RDMA. And the biggest challenge with that is, OK, let's assume somehow you have some mechanism of populating you know, your, your, your data into the PMEM cache. How do I get to it? I have no clue where on the PMEM my data resides, right? That AK4 band. I have no clue sitting on the database server side because I'm not managing that data myself at all. So what the trick here is that we actually break down the read into two steps. So the first step is you go and do our RDMA. Again, it's another RDMA self-service, no waking up another um, the, the, the server process. You go straight to the server's memory and perform a RDMA read of a RDMAable hash table. And then that probe is going to tell you, are you going to have a miss or are you going to have a hit? So let me talk about the happy case first, the, the, the hit case first. So if you do have a hit, meaning you know that Ben's account balance, that record, that block actually is in the PMEM cache, then your probe will also tell you as part of the return results that you read, where exactly on the PMEM on the PMEM is my AK block? What is the virtual address for that? What is the memory key to access that so that I can perform RDMA? And then what you do is you go ahead and just go read that AK from this new location and you have your block in your buffer cache now. So this is extremely powerful. But you may also say, Ja, okay, that's a happy case, right? If I have a hit, I go perform two RDMAs and I get my AK block back. But you know, you say your PMEM cache is you know 1.5 terabytes, your flash is 25 terabytes. Not everything fits in PMEM cache, right? And I totally agree with you. So the way that we do this is that we say, look, if you have a miss, no worries, it's okay. You can go back to the conventional way of sending a message to the storage server. The storage server is going to you know, do the usual lookup and tracks down that block, perhaps into the flash cache, and it's gonna ship that block back to you. So for that very first read, you may, you may in, end up getting a longer latency, like 200 microseconds, but it's okay. Because what happens next on the storage server is because of you had come to me through a messaging, I realized that you were interested in this block, but it's not in the persistent memory cache. So what do I do on the storage server side? Not only do I actually give you back the block, I also post populate that into the persistent memory cache. So that's how we actually populate into the persistent memory cache so that next time you have the same need, let's say the buffer age out from your buffer cache and you need to read it again, you can readily, you can find it readily available in your persistent memory cache and do an RDMA to fetch it the next time. So that's how we handle both misses and hits in that case. And the key thing here is that when you do have a hit, there's no software involved. You know, it's really a nick to nick communication and you get your AK block back. And that's how we actually significantly bring down the IO latency um, for AK random read. So now let's take a look back at this picture. We wanted to, our goal for OLTP is to say, look, we like the, you know, how it runs on the CPU, on the memory. Falls off of IO cliff. And what I do here is I call it a trampoline, you know? I jump, jump, jump on the trampoline, and then we spend nine, maybe sub 19 microseconds, we get our block back. 
from the storage server. So a very natural question one might ask is, look, you know, I launched the RDMA, okay? Let's say I have a hit, I launched the RDMA. What do I do at that point? What does a database process do? Do I like get off the CPU and wait for an interrupt to come in to wake me up and then, you know, to kind of read that um, block? Or do I kind of just busy spinning on the CPU because my RDMA takes, you know, so fast to complete? So I would say that the knowledge actually varies depending on the application. In the case of an Oracle database process, our process unfortunately has a pretty big CPU cache presence. So what that means is if you get off the CPU and gets rescheduled back, you have to incur a huge cost of contact switch. And what we have learned is that we actually ran the test and pleasantly we found that if you just busy spin on the CPU, wait for that completion to come for your RDMA, it gives you lower latency and surprisingly even less CPU. Because if you do the other way around of, you know, I yield and got waken up later through an interrupt processing, not only the latency is much longer, I end up actually spending more CPU doing that. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's kind of interesting find that we have. So what we do is we basically just spin on the CPU, get the block back into our buffer cache, and then we're able to update um, the, um, the balance for Ben and then, you know, complete that change. So we're very happy with that. And this is a slide that kind of summarizes what we just talked about, this whole um, persistent memory um, RDMA technology. As you can see on the storage server side, like I have a pyramid here. So it really tries to illustrate that we have all the data in the code, which is you know the hard disk. And then the warm data, we put it in the flash cache. And then for the cream of the crop, you know the hottest tip of that 25 terabytes is that one terabyte of hottest tip, we put them into persistent memory cache. So you can imagine that the most frequently accessed block from storage gets to be accessed the most, the fastest way with the lowest latency. And that is really sort of really nice for an OLTP application because, you know, instead of just sitting there and waiting for a read to come back, you know, we kind of transform a IO bound application into more like a cache, um, you know, um, like a cached application. So that's, that, that's super nice. All right, so now we've kind of looked at this uh, AK data read problem, right? We say, look, I trampoline over, I get an RDMA AK um, from my persistent memory cache. What is the next step, right? So as a transaction, it has to commit, right? If the, if the transaction doesn't commit, it's no longer a durable change. So in this case, very naturally, the all super critical OLTP application is gonna say, look, I wanna commit the transaction. How do you commit a transaction in a database? Well, it's very, very um, simple. You issue your log rates, right? Everybody who's taken the transaction course will know that, hey, you gotta write your commit to a redo, and then that redo has to be persistent to persistent media. And in this case, um, you know, you may end up doing two separate log writes, one to, one to update the balance change, the second one to commit, or maybe you can do some optimization, combine them into one shot, right? Like, you know, piggyback the commit along with the change itself. So you just issue one log write. But even if you optimize that down to a single log write, I would argue that you fall off the IO cliff again, because you have to send that write to the storage. And that is um, another um, pretty steep uh, wait, a very, very long wait for you. So here comes our challenge number two. Can lightning strike the same place twice? So in this case, for Ben's transaction, yes, the lightning strike again. And then for log writes, we fall into, we just fell into an IO cliff as well. So what happens here is very similar to what we just saw before. The database server has to, you know, package out the redo writes and send it as a message over to the storage server. And on the storage server side, to accelerate log writes, we actually have a lot of interesting innovations in there, you know, even before persistent memory. So I'm just gonna spend a minute talking about that. Is that when you look at log writes, you know, many people say, look, I've just put my log writes on flash. That gives you the lowest latency, fastest commit, and that works well. But flash is not just a piece of hardware. You look at a flash, you say, okay, I see a PCIe card. But what's inside is actually, you know, as we say, I we really think it's software runs everything. <laughs> so what happens inside of Flash is that Flash is not like disk. You can do an in-place update. 
what happens is every cell has to go through this program erase cycle, right? You never write in place. So there's a whole bunch of software code that's running inside a flash card that constantly does the remapping in the background. And that allows you to have, you know, be able to have a low latency flash and high throughput uh, IO bandwidth. But the problem with software code is that, as we all know, we always have bugs, right? Bugs are in inevitable, just like tax and death, I guess. But for us, it's bugs. And there are cases where your code may just run into some sort of glitchy state. What happens in those cases is that if you happen to land a redo log right into a flash right at that moment, you can see outliers. Outliers, by outliers, I mean is normally your write finishes within a micro, 100 microseconds, but occasionally it can take milliseconds to complete. And that has profound implications for OLTP transaction. Because um, in, the, in the case of Oracle database in particular, we have one log writer that kind of aggregates a lot of commits for a lot of foregrounds, kind of batches them and writes them down to the storage. So imagine that single write gets held up. It's not just your own commit. It can you know, get percolated and cascaded to many other transactions. So we say, look, you know, sending right to a single um, destination that can prone, that might be prone to very rare uh, outliers is, is, is not good. So what we do is, look, we have another thing on our storage server, which is that this controller that sits in front of our, all of our disks. But in the disk controller, what's in there is we actually have a persistent DRAM cache that accelerate writes. Again, it's a bunch of software code running inside that piece of hardware, trying to manage in the cache, you know, and write, co coalesce all the smaller writes and dump them back to disk. So normally it's also very fast, but it can also run into its own bugs or glitch or stalls and whatnot. So we actually do a pretty clever trick here is we actually send a log write to both destinations all at the same time. And we say that, look, you two are two separate pieces of hardware. You will have very independent uh, failure characteristics, right? If one flash log, if one flash is running into some problem with this uh, garbage collection, chances are it's not going to overlap with uh, controller cache. Uh, it's its own management. Imagine two independent, low probability independent event of outlier occurring, and we kind of overlay those two together. So what we end up having is eliminating those single outlier situation and would only have a slow log, right? If we have a double outlier, which is really practically negligible because it's very, you know, two independent low probability events. Doesn't so that, that really, sorry, doesn't that really complicate your recovery processing? It uh, does, it does. If you, if you get unlucky and you get uh, out of sync between the disk controller and the flash log, so that's why this is a very sophisticated feature we, we implement inside the storage server that ensures that, you know, it's like runtime is all happy path. It's easy. It's a difficult part. It's exactly what you pointed out as during recovery. If your server were to crash and comes back, how do you reconcile the data? Make sure you never lose any of the log rights. Um, that, that's really where the challenge is. But also, it, it, also, it sounds like there's custom Oracle hardware or controller, the disk controller, all, all that's custom Oracle stuff. No, no, those are actually standard components. So okay. when we go extra data, we like we we take all commodity hardware. So it's okay. like we get flash from multiple vendors, controller from different vendors, and we put them together in the server. So they're not okay. our hardware, but okay. we have learned this painfully. In the beginning, we're all naive. Okay, flash is fast. You know, just controller has a right back cache. What more can you ask for, right? And then you start seeing those logs, right, stalling and all that and be like customer complaining. We'll be like, okay, we got to do something to eliminate those stalls. Okay. And that's okay. why you know, we actually invented that feature. And uh, Okay, even with that feature in place, like we said, you have to go and issue that rate, right, you know, to both destinations, reap whichever one um, comes back first, um, and then send that commit back to the OLTP app from the database site, right? Saying my, my log writes are persisted, now your transaction is good. And uh, I guess I'm, I'm having a sort of, you know, this is like a deja vu, another question. How long did you wait for that log write? And I'm gonna just review the answer. It's the same 200 microseconds because the characteristics are very similar to an AK random uh, read. It's a whole, you know, 100 microseconds on the networking and the context switches and all that, and another 100 microseconds on actually persisting the rate. So the question becomes: is Can we do better here? Like, you know, I don't like that 200 microseconds. Can I run it um, at a much lower latency? So the answer is yes. The same dynamic dual that we just uh, uh, talked about earlier 
um, came to the rescue again. So let's kind of break it down on how we can actually use RDMA and persistent memory to accelerate log writes. So in this case, um, it's very similar to the RDMA picture earlier. On the right-hand side, you have the storage server. So there's a NIC there. And then the database server sends an RDMA request to the storage server to say, look, I really want to write this piece of redo. So what happens on the storage server side is that we take some amount of memory. Actually, we take very little of it, less than 1% of our total persistent memory on a server, on a storage server is used for this purpose. Is we take a very small amount of PMEM um, real estate, and then we carve them into separate receive buffers. And then we create this thing called a shared receive queue on the storage server side. What that does is it allows multiple RDMA connections like from different databases, from different log writers to all RDMA and send their writes to the storage server through the same shared receipt queue. And once the log write lands in the PMEM log buffer, the NIC can simply just go ahead and send an act back to the database server. There's no software processing needed because as soon as you actually deposit your redo in the persistent memory, by definition, it's persistent. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about the durability from that point out. The NIC can then send an act back to the database server. And that way, the database server can actually just go ahead and say, OK, OLTP, uh, super critical OLTP application, your commit is done, you're, you're uh, off to the races. And in the background, what we do is that when a piece of, um, when a send actually lands into a receive buffer on that shared receive queue, the hardware actually generates a notification to the software running on the storage server. It tells you, look, you know, one of your receive buffer has been consumed, you got to do something with it. So upon getting that notification, what our storage software does is it goes and takes that piece of redo and destage it back to the backing store. You know, we talked about flash, we talked about the disk controller cache, we, we put them back. As soon as the, the redo is copied back to the backing store, that piece of persistent memory receive buffer is completely freed up, right? I don't need it anymore because that persistence is already accomplished through my disk or flash on the other end. So what I do is I repost that buffer back to the same queue again. So that enables a very small set of receive buffers to be reused repeatedly for very high throughput of log writes. And that we call it, we can have a cake and eat it too, because we want the PMEM, the persistent memory to majority of it, 99% of it to be used for caching because that allows us to cache as, as big of a working set into it as possible, right? And we take a tiny bit, less than 1%, and we, we um, use that as a persistent memory log buffer in a circular fashion to facilitate and accelerate log rates. And if you ask me, um, what happens if you have a power outage, Ja? You know, it's like, I want my durability. Like, how is my redo safe if I have a power outage? And what happens is, um, brings us to the next slide. So previously we have talked about, look, you know, persistent memory is not a piece of cake. You don't just pop it into your dim slot and then expect persistence. The reason I say that is, you know, this one, you know, example here is a great illustration. So you can see this very simple diagram, right? Like I have a server, I didn't draw a server, but imagine, you know, you have a server on the left-hand side. You have a bunch of CPUs and may have some shared L3 cache. And then um, there's a NIC card that receives, you know, um, the RDMA through the network. And then you have a PCIe bus that connects you either, you know, to, 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 to the CPU and then the memory. So on the uh, Intel platform that we run, we have this technology called Intel Di uh, Data Direct I.O., DDIO for short. What that enables um, us to do is that when your network card receives some, you know, packets, information, whatever, you know, it can actually directly perform a write allocate or update into an L3 cache, like the last level cache. And that is generally a very favorable feature because imagine that, you know, uh, when, when, you when, you do an, when you have a receive on the network, you land all that data in your L3 cache, and then you can just wake up that process who's waiting for that, and that process is ready to run and finds all the data it needs is readily available in the L3 cache. So that's a greatly performance enhancing feature. But when it comes to persistent memory, that feature actually gets in the way. And the reason for that is that I draw a little dotted line across a persistent memory is that there is a thing called an ADR safe domain. ADR stands for asynchronous DRAM refresh. So it's kind of a hardware term. <laughs> well, essentially it means that 
your rate has to land in this dotted box before that rate can be made persistent across a power failure. So if you have DDIO turned on, all your log rates wind up in your last level cache. And that cache we have talked about earlier, if you just pull the power plug right then and there, it's going to get lost. So you'll be like, oh, I thought I committed that, you know, $100 deposit, $1,000 deposit. What happens? So that's not acceptable. So how do we ensure that this is actually persistent? So we have to make a very difficult choice, which is we actually have to turn off this thing called a DDIO so that all the NIC receives go direct to the memory. And this applies both for DRAM-based uh, receives as well for PMEM-based receives. Because unfortunately, the platform we have, it just have a single global knob that controls all receives on that NIC card. And I know that um, you know, we have NIC vendors and then CPU vendors who are working very close on that, trying to be able to do better in the future so that you can actually tag each network transaction receive. And with different tags, you can say, okay, this is going to the volatile memory. There's no need to uh, worry about persistence. So I'll just land it in the CPU cache. And this is to the persistent memory. I'll bypass CPU cache and go straight to the ADR uh, safe domain. And we do actually encounter some negative impact because of you know, the, the uh, turning off the data direct IO as a result. And we have to come up with other creative software engineering tricks to kind of mitigate that impact. So I just want to bring it up as an um, you know, important point. And the second point I wanted to mention is that the network can also get congested, right? Because um, that log write is you know, super low latency. I really want to get there fast. These are the lowest latency IOs I want. And then maybe there's a medium priority IO, for example, my OLTP data reads. And then there's kind of workloads like reporting, backup, batch. They're like higher priority, you know, higher throughput, but definitely lowest priority. So I don't want those large throughput batch workloads to kind of get in the way of my super low latency IOs, right? So what we do is we actually carve out different traffic classes for all of our network packets. So from the database to the storage server and backwards, we make sure we pick different lanes for different traffic. So imagine you go on a highway, everybody may be congested in the regular lanes, but you get to go on the VIP lanes that's you know, reserved for maybe emergency response vehicles and whatnot. So you get super low latency, even though your network is saturated. And this has to be done every step of the way, you know, on every switch and on every uh, NIC card received. So that's that's another very important feature that we put in to make sure that we have low latency IOs. So let's, let's put all of this together, right? We have RDMA write, we trampoline that over. Again, we jump on the same trampoline, we get into um, do a super fast RDMA write to the persistent memory log, and we're able to get a much faster log writes. So what happened to Ben's transaction? Well, Ben is pretty happy about that, right? It's like, are we done? Okay, I deposit my money and my transactions committed. But the database, I wanted to say, is still left with one more challenge, which is it has that AK block, right? Which is dirty. And eventually maybe it gets cold. It has to be written back to the storage or maybe I have a checkpoint that I have to meet. I have to write it out. So what do I do with that dirty block? I have to write it back to the storage. And here comes my last challenge for the presentation is, why is it so difficult about writing data back to a PMEM cache, you know, back to PMEM in the storage server? So one of the things I wanted to ask you, I don't know if everybody knows the word splinch. Um, if, if you're, I know we're running short on time, so I'm just going to complete the story. So if you're like me who loves Harry Potter and the wizarding world, you will know that splinch is a phenomenon that occurs if a witch or a wizard has to magically disapparate, meaning disappear, and reapparate, meaning appear to a new location. So it's a magical form of teleportation. A splinch happens is when you, when a, 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 a wizard or witch is not very careful, they may end up moving to a new location, but leaving part of their maybe eyebrow, a piece of clothing in the original location. So in the database parlance, we call it a torn block. So in database, you don't want your block ever to be fractured, right? Because if it's fractured, it's gone. What can you do with it? You have to do media recovery and do all sorts of other crazy stuff to recover that. So having sector atomicity is extremely important for the durability part of database transaction processing. So on persistent memory, it gives another challenge is that 
the durability on PMEM is only eight byte atomic write guarantee. It's not like the 512 bytes or 4K that you normally get from a disk or, or a flash. And we certainly don't want our database rights to be fractured, right? Because that would result in uh, torn blocks and database losses. So the question here is, is RDMA to persistent memory a good choice here? I would say no, hell no. <laughs> because you think about it, if, this, if you just write an AK block through RDMA, and you know where to go on PMEM, let's say you land it there, and then the server just dies right then and there. What happens? Your block gets fractured, right? And not to mention that, you know, we have network MTU underneath the cover and that your seemingly one block to you as a logical rate can be chopped up into multiple fragments we send over the network. So even more chances for uh, hitting a splinch. So how do I avoid a splinch? So good thing is if you also go to Hogwarts, you take that operation class, it's gonna tell, and the teacher is gonna tell you there are three principles, the 3D principle you have to follow. It's called destination, determination, and deliberation. So we are very inspired by that. And we feel like those 3D principles can help us prevent the database block splinch as well. So first, destination. From a database point of view, I know where I need to send my um, PMEM rights. Sure, what I do is I send a regular message. I don't do the fancy RDM matrix we talked about before. I send through a regular message. And then when the storage cell software actually gets that message, it makes a determination to say, look, okay, this block is actually on my persistent memory. So I gotta be really careful. I don't want to have a splinch. And the deliberation part is where the trick happens is that we actually introduce a trick called a staging right. You can do it many other ways, but the way we happen to employ is we carve out a separate area we call staging buffers. And when we need to write to persistent memory, we actually perform two writes. The first write is to the staging area to say, look, I'm gonna land that whatever, 8K or 512 bytes or whatever block um, in the staging area in its entirety and make sure that you know I set up a barrier and make sure that my write is complete. And then I send the write to the actual location on my PMEM cache where that AK block resides. And you can ask me, you know, okay, Jia, why do you bother to do the two writes, right? Like, how does that help you prevent a splinch? So if you have a power outage, let's say, and it happens to die at the point where not all of your write, the second write to the actual location gets persisted, only half of it made it. What you can do in that case is you can perform what we call a staging buffer recovery. And what that does is that remember, I already write my entire update in the other location prior to I issue the second rate. So I just copy it over. I just rewrite the whole thing and make sure that it's complete. And that is how we guarantee that we'll never get a fractured block. And if the server dies during the very first write to the staging block area, that's even less work to do, right? Because nothing has, nobody has touched my PMAN cache line on that original location and there's no recovery even needed there. That block is still consistent. So this is what we do, but there's still one more trick that we have so to- I would say that, that double, that's the double write back buffer in MySQL, the same trick. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right, so then let's take a closer look at how do you guarantee that your write to the persistent memory is actually persisted across a power cycle. We learned how to do that for a PCIe initiated, right? Like a network RDMA, but there's a different trick you need to apply if you initiate the update or the store from a CPU core, which is the case that we're talking about here, is that you gotta be able to either flush all your write through your CPU cache, or you have to bypass your CPU cache. Either one of them has to be done. And in our case, we are not interested in inspecting that AK block, right? It's a database of writing it back, you know, he may want to read it later, but as the storage server, I don't care about what's in that AK block. So instead of polluting my CPU cache and just write it through the cache and then, you know, flush it at the end, which is actually painfully slow, what we do is we, we use this non-temporal store instruction to bypass the CPU cache completely and then avoiding um, polluting the CPU cache. And this ensures that the store is persistent. And then we add an S fence as a memory barrier to make sure that, you know, that, that store is actually made it to the persistent memory. Okay, one last quick word about PMEM writing is that we hit a very interesting performance problem earlier on in our journey is that 
you know, normally when you have a disk or a flash, you say, look, how do I extract the best throughput from that device, right? The trick is to load it up, right? Queue it with as many IOs you can afford to do. And naturally the device gets saturated, you get the highest throughput. But in this case, when we did the same trick, we saw this precipitous fall, like you see the yellow line here of a 10X drop in the performance of writing to persistent memory. And we're like, we're really puzzled. What happened there? So our partners at Intel educated us on that. There's this thing called IO directory hash. So this is a directory state that the CPU has to maintain to track all the writes to avoid a snoop. So what ends up happening is that even though PMEM write, reads are super fast, like two to three X faster, the writes is actually seven to 10 X slower than DRAM. So it's significantly slower. So what ends up happening is you have a lot of writes hitting the PMEM DIM. You, the directory, IO directory cache updates is a separate update to the PMEM because that cache, cache state is co-located with the PMEM data um, cache line as well together. So that additional update um, causes a, a deg degradation in the write performance. And in addition, as more threads will jam in, there's limited, like they call it like the write buffer inside the PMEM DIM. So that you end up fragmenting that write buffer, causing a thrashing and the whole performance kind of just drop. And like kind of, this is a really like a precipitous IO cliff, I would say like it really falls off the cliff. So the, the trick there is to really enable the IO directory cache so that you can combine that directory update along with your actual data update. So you piggyback on that and you reduce additional write. And that's why it gives you not a 2x improvement, but a significant improvement on the total write throughput, you know, to avoid that thrashing inside the PMEM. So that was an important finding. And then, you know, it really helped with our PMEM write throughput as well. So Key takeaway, I guess, you know, for this talk is really, if you have a database uh, transaction processing, let's not fall off the IO cliff. Let's do the RDMA read for your, uh, for your AK on um, random data read needs. And then let's do the RDMA write for your PMEM log. And I often get a question saying, Ja, you know, you tell me this band's transaction is so silly, right? Like if I am on my phone, like for me to enter, you know, that transaction, it probably take, I don't know, milliseconds or even centiseconds for my phone to find the nearest cell tower to even send the bits over. Who cares about this 200 microseconds or 19 microsecond latency? So my answer to that is really, this is just a presentation example to illustrate the point, but we really have a lot of really real supercritical OLTP applications that run on Exadata. Like for example, they do fraud tracking or they do uh, real-time analytics. When you click or navigate a screen, a lot of um, processing, backend processing happens concurrently. So for that, this kind of uh, RDMA to PMEM, low latency IOs are extremely crucial for those uh, low latency, high throughput OLTP applications. So with that said, I guess this is really summarizes everything that we talked about in this presentation is really, you know, we have a persistent memory tier in the storage. We pair it up with 100 gigabits Rocky, and that's how we accomplish our, you know, very low latency IOs and very, very, very fast log writes. And then the good thing about this story is that it's actually scaling. It's tiered and shared across databases. And as you know, if you remember the earlier slides, we have multiple racks. So it's not really limited, let's say by your PCIe extenders or other kind of hardware technology, which kind of limits how far you can extend this. We can hop across networks, which is no problem. And that really allows this architecture to scale very nicely um, on Exadata. So, that's all I have for OLTP. And, uh, you know, Andy, I know we talked about um, earlier about, you know, what does an Exadata do? Is it just OLTP or do you guys do data warehousing? So before I end this presentation, I'll spend the next 30 seconds really fast through data warehousing because that deserves its own talk somewhere else, you know, like maybe offline or maybe at a different occasion. But we also do amazing data warehousing analytics on uh, Exadata. And this is from an Exadata user who, you know, wants to read 600 gigabytes of table rows and then had the storage index tr trim, you know, 500 gigabytes of it. And then it scans through the flash cache and returns only 280, you know, through smart scan. So that is a whole different story with Exadata analytics. I don't have time to go through that, but I'm just gonna give you a quick teaser and sneak preview of, you know, what we have accomplished there. And uh, um, just to kind of complete the story that we do both OLTP and data warehousing really well on Exadata.
All right, so that's all I have. Back to you, Andy. Okay, awesome. So I will, I will applaud uh, on that everyone else. So we're a little bit over time, so maybe have time for one or two more questions from the audience. Hi, uh, Jia, this is Lin. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have a question, which is that you mentioned um, you're using roughly 1% of the persistent memory for uh, redo log, which is really leveraging the persistent persistency property of PM. Mm -hmm. Then it seems that the remaining 99%, you are not really leveraging the persistency property per se. So is it possible to just replace that 99% with DRAM or like, is there any reason uh, that PM is still better in this case? Yeah, that's, that's really, really a perfect, a great question. So um, the pre-PMEM cache, as you pointed out, right, that's where we actually enable the RDMA. So at some level, you could argue, has nothing to do with persistent memory, right? You could do that 10 years ago. If you have memory and you have an RDMA network, you could build that, right? Like a write-through cache. So what, if I lose all my data across the server failure? I don't care. But what is really actually really important for persistent memory is that one of the things uh, I didn't spend much time on because you know we, we're limited by time is that PMEM also brought in this capacity differentiator when compared to DRAM. So when we deployed the system back in 2019, we we're able to pack 1.5 terabytes of PMEM in a storage server. And if you know, you're friends with Intel and you have a big wallet, you can actually pack six terabytes of PMEM into a single server. So it brings you much higher memory density and allows you to build a real cache using that kind of budget. Because if you just simply look at DRAM, oh, I got 200 gig, oh, I got you know, 500 gig, how am I going to be able to build a cache? You know, as soon as you populate into the RU and before the next IO happens, it's out of your <laughs> cache already, right? So for the fact about PMEM is it actually gives you the capacity advantage and still being able to sit on the memory bus and allow you to do the RDMA that gives us the benefit. So that's why even though we wanted to do that many years ago, we couldn't quite pull it up until PMEM comes along. Does that make sense? And to answer the persistence question, what I would say is that uh, we can definitely put per, um, the PMEM cache in persistence mode. So you could just you know, restart your server, you still have everything in there warmed up, you know, ready to go. So that's still like nicer than a DRAM cache where you have to repopulate everything you know, um, after a restart. Yeah, got it, yeah. thanks a lot for the answer. You're welcome. Hey, gee, this is here. That was a great presentation. One question: All these parameters are configurable at the cluster level, or it's all autonomous? That that you guys call it's handled by behind the scene. Okay, I guess by parameters you mean how much I use for PMM cache, how much I use for PMM mm -hmm. lock, like I've listed here, right? So right. these are all created automatically with the default. But you know, if you are you want to tinker with that, you're more than welcome. We have proper API that you can go on a storage server and configure that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have a question from Eduardo. Um, can he unmute himself? I'll read it in the chat. All right, so this question is, what is recommended with this technology, small redo logs and several switches or large redo logs and a few switches has been handled lately with the other active data models? Several switches. Um, Andy, do you have any guess what the switches means here? This, uh, this is a uh, uh, redo lock to archive lock switches, lock switching. That's what he's talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was guessing because I wasn't sure it's a network switch if it's a log switch. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of address that. What happens is that a log switch doesn't happen on Oracle until your redo log is filled up. So it really has nothing to do with how big your log writes are. Because you can imagine like typically maybe a log file is, I don't know, 50 gigs or a few, a few I don't know, 10 gigs, whatever size it is. Every write is much, much smaller, right? Because you got to commit a transaction. Even in TPCC, I think the average log write size around like maybe 200K to 100K. So those are much smaller, not to mention if you have a small transaction, you can even have, you know, a 4K write or even a, sub, you know, a 5, 12 byte write. So it really has nothing with log switches. It's just accelerating every single individual log writes using the PMM RDMA technology. And whenever that log fills up, sure, a log switch happens and then you end up using the next log. So it really has nothing to do with how frequently you switch the log. But I guess, you know, because our writes are so much faster, it might, and you might end up, you know, switching your logs faster. So that's, that, that could happen, but you know, it's really orthogonal. 
Okay. Uh, so my last question would be, this software is great because you showed basically how through like careful database and you know, database software engineering, you're able to take advantage of all the new hardware that Intel and everyone else is throwing at you. So I guess the question is, what's the next bottleneck? Like you've already, you know, you're, 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 you're shaving off microseconds uh, when you're IO. What's the, what would be the next target? Like if you had a magic wand to fix one thing, like do you have to redesign now your, your data structures up in like the, the database server because now you know that disk IO is, is you know minimized like what's what's the next sort of mountain mountain climb yeah yeah it's 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 a great question Andy. we ask that question all the time you know are we done <laughs> do we declare victory so what we really feel like this is really just tip of the iceberg of our way of using persistent memory for database because when you think about it um like perfect example that we have is like you know i talked about we have b tree index have you ever wondered why does a database use a B tree index? You know, why, why, why do we just not store a hash table, you know, directly on disk? Wouldn't that be nice? You read the hash table out, you got your everything instead of having to walk down a tree. So it turns out that the B tree index is very nice because it's very disk block storage friendly, right? You can store it, you can, you can, you know, sort of read it back, you can populate, you can walk down the tree, it's, it's great. But if you have a hash table, it becomes much more challenging. How do you store a hash table on disk, right? Like, so what I wanted to say is that this acceleration in the IO path is really very, still very much along the block storage sort of mindset that we have about a database, right? How to accelerate your access to it. But there are so many other new possibilities you can do with persistent memory, right? Especially when it comes to database, because what happens if you use database um, persistent memory as your native storage? Like forget about all the block storage, right? Can you do something with that? So to me, I just feel like we're like, you know, the first step on this big epic journey of, you know, exploiting or harnessing the power of persistent memory. And there are bound to be many, many new innovations that's, that can be um, done on the database space. With that. But it's just, this, this is my, my first PhD student's thesis was basically answering that as that question. Right? <laughs> like, like, how do you, if you throw away, throw away DRAM, throw away flash, how do you build a new system? Right, so that's right. awesome. Okay, awesome. John, thank you so much for doing this. This is an excellent talk.